How you doing picking up all those leaves out in your house? I'm struggling with it, but you know what? We got just the thing for you. We got kids that are wanting to go to Whiteout and they're trying to make money. So if you want to bring some over and you got some odd jobs, some things around the house that you're willing to pay some money for, for a great cause, they can go to Whiteout. So go out to the atrium out there. You can get one of the contact cards, fill it out, and they'll come pick up your leaves. Pretty good. Have you heard of Solo Together? It's our Christian singles group for folks that are 30 and over, and they meet the second Sunday of every month down in the chapel. It's from 6 to 8. It's a great time to reconnect with old friends, make new ones, and have a great time of fellowship. Come join us. Once again, we're going to be doing our Homes of Hope mission trip down to Ensenada, Mexico. It's going to happen March 12th to the 18th, 2011. And if you want a great introduction to mission trips, or if you just want to do another great short mission trip, you can get more information by contacting Kim Kokos at her email address, or you can pick up an application at the missions desk in the atrium. That's it for this week. If you need more information, you can always go out to the desks out in the atrium and in the lobby, and there's great people there that are going to fill you in on what's happening here at Canyon View. You can go to our website. You can fill out that card at the bottom of your bulletin and let us know, and we'll get you signed up on our newsletter as well. Have a great week. When you think of poverty, do you see a face? Here's one. Here's another one. Here is Kate. Kate lives in the Philippines, a small set of islands speckling the South Pacific. Kate's face is only one. One of 30 million faces, lives and hearts, existing, breathing, and surviving in poverty. And the Philippines? Just one set of speckles on a globe full of Kate's. Kate's face is only one. One face out of tens of thousands that Convoy of Hope feed through one day to feed the world. Kate lives in San Jose de Monte, a squatter relocation camp created with good intentions by the Filipino government. Sometimes I I go to I go to bed, I sleep, I I have no food in my stomach. It's exciting when the food comes in our house. I receive the food in from the church. Every Saturday. But it doesn't stop there. Kate and her friends also receive a portion of food to help supplement their family's meals until the next week. Kate will be back next week, and for many weeks to come. That's because she knows the importance of food, because she's experienced too many school days without it. If I don't have enough food, I, I can't concentrate in my study and I can't understand what my teacher was saying to me. The food that they give to us, it helps me to memorize the, the lessons that my teacher gave to, to memorize. You see, Kate has placed a lot of value in her education. She's smart. She knows that she can provide a better home, and more importantly, a better life for herself and her family. That's why we keep seeing Kate's face week after week. Well-nourished kids like Kate thrive in school, at home, and for the rest of their lives. And that's why one day, when we think of poverty, we won't see Kate's face. Thank you, because the food that they give to us will, will not be <laughs> will not be wasted. In honor of myself, Kirk Yamaguchi, and our worship pastor, Rani Haigera, Kombawa Muchachos.
didn't know I was multilingual, did you? <laughs> Just uh, a reminder for those of you who uh, maybe weren't here last week to hear us introduce this concept of uh, one day to feed the world through Convoy of Hope. Convoy of Hope is uh, an international ministry that we have had relationship with for with the last couple of years. And the concept is really quite simple. We take one offering a year that we give the whole offering uh, to Convoy of Hope. And Convoy of Hope is a ministry that does emergency response for natural disasters, and they feed the poor around the world, especially targeting children, like you heard the story of there, and that kind of wrecks you when you hear that story, doesn't it? And they also have uh, a ministry that they go to communities and do like a giant share fest ministry in uh, concert with the ch local churches. And so we love what Convoy of Hope does. And, and one of the great things is because they have so much favor with uh, secular corporations, they are literally able to, for your $1 donation, to buy 7 to $10 worth of supplies. And they have it stored and as soon as that there's an emergency somewhere in the world, they're already beginning their operations to send in relief work. And they're like in Haiti. Right now, they're feeding 40,000 kids a day in Haiti. So uh, one of the great things about this is we pay forward that this offering that we take on Thanksgiving is for the whole year. And so if there is... a like an earthquake that will happen in 2012, we already paid in advance to help with that. And so we just encourage you guys to talk with your families and to pray about considering literally taking one of your day's wages, whatever that would be, writing a check next week to, to Canyon View Vineyard Church. We're going to collect all that money at the end of the service. This is over and above the tithe and we are going to give that amount to Convoy of Hope. Last year, we raised 48, over $48,000. This year, Jane says she's praying for 75. I pledged 50. <laughs> but anyway, uh, be praying for that. We're talking to our kids on how they can re uh, respond to this and how they can participate, and there are many ways that, uh, that I think you guys can be creative about taking lunch money or taking part of uh, selling something or doing something that you can give for Convoy of Hope, okay? Well, this is a special weekend for us, uh, for our family and a uh, number of the good-looking families that are sitting over here. And uh, two Fridays ago, Gracie and I piled up in my car and we drove down to Denver because we wanted to watch uh, my nephew who's a senior at Palmer High School, play Lakewood High School in, in the playoffs. And he's a middle linebacker for Palmer High School and never seen him play, and so we went to watch. And um, by the way, Palmer won 32 to nothing. So, but they lost today. Anyway, um, Gracie was in the, in the stands with us, and there was this young man who came and sat by us, and... Uh, he had a, an earring in his lip right, right here. I guess, you'd, would you call it a lip ring? I don't know. So, so Gracie, being inquisitive like she is, she's five years old, and we adopted her from China four years ago, and she's not real shy, as some of you know. And uh, she goes up to him, and she's looking at him, and we're all watching this, and I'm going, oh, no. And she goes... What happened to your lip? <laughs> and the guy started playing with her. And he goes, it's a fish hook. <laughs> and so she goes, how'd you get a fish hook in your lip? He goes, so I was swimming in a lake and got caught in my lip. <laughs> Gracie puts her hands on her hips and she looks at him. And goes, put this on your list. Don't swim in that lake anymore. <laughs> oh, obviously, we haven't done very well teaching her the social graces. 
So today, as this is our adoption weekend during our uh, social justice month, I want you to put this on your list. God has a special place in his heart for the fatherless. Man, I was praying that I wouldn't cry tonight. <laughs> How do I know this? Because it's in the scriptures. Psalm 10, verse 17 says, You hear, O Lord, the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them, and you listen to their cry. Defending the fatherless, the orphans, and the oppressed. You know, uh, one of the wonderful families in our church that had already adopted before we got came here, they have adopted a, a two beautiful kids from Ethiopia, and their biological daughter, Erica, has had the blessing of experiencing having two orphans join their family and blend their families together. And uh, Erica has a real gift, and Erica took it upon herself to write a song in honor of the orphans that are still in orphanages. And John James, our video guy, uh, produced the music and made this music video. And let's turn to the screens and watch Erica's video. Hi, my name is Erica. Four years ago, back when I was 11, I didn't think much about orphans. But then my parents went and adopted a brother and a sister. It changed the way I looked at the world. So I wrote this song for all the orphans left behind.
The, the word fatherless or orphans is used 45 times in the scriptures, in the Old Testament to the New Testament. If something's spoken of 45 times in the scriptures, I kind of get a sense that this is something that's dear to the Father's heart. As Jesus said, if you feed the least of these and clothe the least of these, you've done it for me. And I think that the Jesus was thinking not only of those in prison and not only those on the streets, but of the kids, the orphans. And obviously this is a special day for our family because we've adopted two girls, Gracie uh, four years ago from China and, and Gertie uh, last January from Haiti. And it's become a passion of our home. It's even trickled down to Wade, our son, and his wife, Chelsea, and, and Joey, that I told him, when you get married, you need to adopt too. <laughs> but the statistics are staggering. If you really look at it, it says that every 15 seconds, another child becomes an AIDS orphan just in Africa. Every day, 5,700 more children become orphans. Every year, two million more children become orphans in just Africa alone. 165 million orphans in the world today are spending an average of 10 years in an, orf in an orphanage or in a foster home. And then approximately 250,000 children are adopted annually. That's the good news. But every year, 14 million children are still growing up in orphanages, and they age out of the system. And these kids that age out of the system in Ukraine, in Russia, they say that 10 to 15 percent of the children will commit suicide before the age of 18. 60 percent of the girls are lured into prostitution, like we talked about last week with human trafficking, and 70 percent of the boys become hardened uh, criminals. Many of these kids obviously accept jobs and are lured into human slavery, sex trafficking, and so forth. So we have a, a group of wonderful folks that have answered the call of the orphans already. And I just want to, uh, for you to maybe see some of them. So those of you in this room that have already adopted, whether recently or even some of you, I know years ago. Can, can you please stand, because we want to acknowledge you. God bless you guys. That's awesome. Our, our leadership of Woven Families, uh, uh, they kind of told me what to talk about tonight, and this is the one night I'm not in charge. And uh, they said, recommended that we have three of the men that have actually adopted to come up here and, and for us to have a little uh, Johnny Carson interview. And so I've asked uh, Ted Weber, Steve Malloy, and Greg Stevens to come on up here, and, and I want you to hear their story. And uh, while they're doing that, we have a video of, of some of the dads that have adopted from our Woven Family Group, and uh, I want you to watch this video where the guys are coming up. I'm David Brown, and I'm a stay-at-home dad. I'm Paul Waters, I work for Excel Energy. I'm Ted Weber, and I'm a fireman for the City Grand Junction. I'm Dan Wells, and I roast coffee for a living. Denny Vigil, and I'm a supply chain contract specialist for Occidental. My name is Steve Malloy, and I'm a regional manager for Honan Equipment Company. My name is Gilbert Maynard, and I'm a computer-aided designer. Don Stadelman, I work at Halliburton Energy Services. I'm Daniele Balsamo, and I'm an architectural illustrator. Greg Stevens, I'm an account manager in an insurance agency. I'm Justin Witt, and I build street rods for a living. I'm William Cox, and I'm a police officer. I'm Kirk Yamaguchi, and I'm the token Oriental pastor in Grand Junction. <laughs> hey guys, thanks for being here. And, uh, you know, Greg, I'm, we're going to start off with you, bro. And uh, I know you, a little bit of your story, and I know that initially you weren't real hot on this idea of adoption, and Jessica was. 
what happened, what transpired in you about God finally grabbing your heart to eventually decide to uh, adopt little James Lee from Haiti? Well, you know, just a little history. I think about um, my wife and I and our story. We uh, tried getting pregnant for three years and uh, finally did get pregnant. And so we have a biological daughter, Katie. She's eight, wonderful. And I uh, continued to try to get pregnant after that and just, you know, couldn't, couldn't make it happen. So I tried all the fertility drugs and everything else and um, just didn't, you know, it, it wasn't, in our, wasn't in the plan for us. So I did have some friends talking to me about adoption, but I just constantly, like you said, just put it off, you know, and Jessica was all for it and, you know, adoption, adoption, adoption. And I think the thing that clicked for me is when I came um, and heard about orphans rather than adoption. That was a big transition for me when it stopped being about adoption. And I thought of adoption as, you know, other things. And when it started becoming realistic um, and started becoming real um, about the orphan, that was a big change for me. So you brought James Lee home from, from Haiti after the earthquake like we do, yeah. we did. And so how would you describe how James Lee has changed your life personally? I mean, obviously our life has changed, you know, in a lot of... A lot of ways, um, you know. Adoption has been great. My, I love my son. He's a wonderful little boy, um, but you know it's been hard as well. You know, I think adoption for us has been um, a God-given mechanism in our lives to bring out some issues that may not have come out in our own lives um, that have drawn us to a closer relationship with the Lord. Overall, it's been wonderful. So it's been kind of a, a refining thing for you. Absolutely. And yeah. I, you know, I, I just have to venture to guess that those issues wouldn't have come about had we had not answered the call. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Greg. Sure. So, Ted, uh, you and Judy uh, adopted Abram from Ethiopia what, a year ago? Is that? Yeah, we brought him home a year ago. I still remember when you walked him over to us the first <laughs> weekend. I think it was Christmas Eve. Was that Christmas Eve? It was. Brought tears to my eyes, man. Uh, Ted, what has God revealed to you personally through this whole adoption process? I know your oldest daughter is adopted too. True. Um, well, it's similar to what uh, Greg said, we had infertility issues and we chose foster care uh, 13 years ago. And we ended up with Hannah, our uh, lovely almost 13-year-old daughter. And uh, she's been a blessing, and we tried foster care again, and we just wasn't in the cards for us to have a second child. So um, we kicked around the idea of adoption. And um, actually, two years ago at this church, you had the call, and uh, I think the Hoffman kids were up on the, on the big screen, and um, we both felt we didn't know. We didn't look at each other. We just knew that we had to come up, and we came up, and we both knew that we had to go to Africa. We didn't know where, but Africa to get a son. And we both knew it had to be an um, African child that was a boy. Mm. So um, since then, he's been great watching him grow and develop and interact with Hannah. It's been fun. I, I would probably direct the same way with, I did with Greg, is, is how have you been impacted with having Abram? What has the Lord done in your life through this? It's, it's been life-changing. Um, you know, we, we, did the, we did the church thing. We played church. But I think once you take that step of faith and you said a couple of weeks at the baptism, you get radical. That's, I think that was our color. That's what we've dove into as a family. And um, we've just embraced it. And because of that, uh, we're going back to Ethiopia and uh, we just received referral for two more children. So, um, a boy and a girl. Boy and a girl. And they're older children. Yeah. Um, both my wife and I aren't spring chickens. We're not over the hill yet, but uh, we, we're done with the whole baby thing. So um, we adopted Abraham when he was six, and then uh, our two newest children will be five and nine. So we have a heart for older kids, and um, because, you know, like you said, they age out, and they're forgotten. Yeah. The aged out kids sometimes are the most difficult for orphanages to adopt. So uh, God bless you guys for what you're doing. With steve -O. How you doing over there? I'm good. We saved the best for last, right? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, you, you had one beautiful daughter, and, and now you have adopted two beautiful young boys yep. domestically. 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 Yep. And be sure and talk into the microphone, Steve. Okay. Okay. So, um, how did you guys come to this crazy, radical idea about adopting two 
these great boys domestically? Um, you know, it wasn't, uh, it was the same, we had infertility issues too. So our, our daughter, uh, our biological daughter uh, is a gift to us through in vitro. And um, so we tried to do it, uh, you know, we tried to plan, we, tr we tr it was all, you know, it was, it was all about us at that time. And um, we were at a church service in Casper, Wyoming about oh, five or six years ago. And there was a young missionary couple that uh, were speaking from Africa. She was in the medical field. And uh, he was just, uh, I think he was a carpenter and was helping to build uh, schools. And she was, uh, they would go over to Africa and administer uh, vaccines and, and orphanages. So needless to say that they, their heart got wrecked. But one of the things that uh, <laughs> they shared, which was, I hope I can get through it. But one evening, um, the lady was coming back to wherever they were staying and uh, they were walking and heard a kind of a muddled cry and uh, it was coming from a latrine uh, excuse me and there was actually a child left in in a latrine to die and um, that child was there they, they they brought that child in they saved that child and that child was standing there at church years mm. later, you know, eight years old. And, and, sorry. So at that moment, I understood that what we had, what we had been trying to do was, was, it was selfish for us. We were trying to grow our family for us, my wife and I, and me in particular. So at that point, I knew it had nothing to do with me anymore. It was all about the children. So I knew right then that I could adopt a, another man's son. I could, that I, I, was, I was game at that time. Mm -hmm. So that was really, that was the aha moment, if you will. And now you guys are in the process of adopting one more. Yeah, one more. Awesome. Any day. That's so, awesome. Any day you any could day. get your referral. Any day. <laughs> that's, great. Yeah, that's great. So you guys, in, in conclusion, is there anything else you would like to add or say in regards to this whole crazy idea of adoption or foster care. <laughs> I think it's simple. Um, you need to get outside of your comfort zone. Uh, I thought about this question a lot this week, and um, the thought that kept coming to my mind was Jesus walking across the water, and he came across the fellows in the boat. And uh, he said, don't worry, it's me. I'm paraphrasing, by the way. And um, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, call me to you. And Jesus said, come. Hmm. And Peter got out of the boat and he walked to him. So I would just ask you all, check your hearts. If your heart's pounding right now, probably something that he's trying to tell you. Get out of the boat and walk. Amen. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna hold on to you and he's not going to leave you. I mean, you just got to get outside of your box and get radical and just settle out. Don't play church, live it. That's tough to follow. <laughs> um, I would say much the same. I mean, the, 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 the biggest thing that kind of held us back is just fear. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we insulate ourselves uh, in this society, and, um, you know, a lot of people enter into the back of their house through the garage and out, and you never see your neighbors and all that. And it just... You just there's a certain amount of fear that, that gets involved in, in, uh, in the adoption process, whether it's financially or just changing the dynamics of your existing family. But um, you, have to, you have to lay that fear down, um, and, and you do get radical. But I think um, if you truly do have compassion, and if you, you look at Jesus, I mean, he, Jesus had compassion, but that compassion translated into action. And um, if you just have empathy without action, it's apathy. Hmm. And that's not good. Okay. So. That's a great word. I think for us, uh, and something else I would encourage is to get tapped into um, resources that are available to you to support you during that time as well. I know for uh, <clears throat> Jessica and I, um, you know, we really dealt with a lot of attack once we kind of stepped forward in that area. And we've had some wonderful people in our lives support us and you know our, our ministry is a good example of that um, the friends and the resources that uh, that we have supporting us throughout so 
Awesome. Hey, what'd you guys think? They did a pretty good job, huh? Thanks, you guys. God bless you. God bless you. Exit stage right. Well, there's more to the story of Gracie at the football game. <laughs> she then asks this young man, she's looking at him, are you married? <laughs> and he goes, no, I'm not married. And she goes, well, how come? <laughs> and he goes, well, I'm too young to get married. So she, you know, being inquisitive and intrusive, the way she is. She says, well, how are you? And he says, well, I'm only 21. And she puts her hands on her hips again, and she goes, well, my brother Wade is 21, and he's married, so you should be married too. <laughs> and I could see the look in this guy's eyes then, like, who is this chick? <laughs> but like these guys were saying, if God's tugging on our hearts... And the one thing I want to emphasize here is we're not just promoting just adoption, that there's foster care, but we're also promoting that we as a church support the ministry of these orphans, that regardless of what age we are and where we are in our life, there's a way that all of us can be a part of bringing more of these kids back. Now, that's a great deal, isn't it? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So, with, regardless of whatever excuse that we have, I, I think the reality is, is we need to ask, what is God saying to you? It's a personal thing. It's something that we have to be open to the Holy Spirit speaking into each of our hearts. I, I know that uh, adoption isn't for everyone. It's a special, unique calling for a few. If God didn't wreck our hearts, Jane and I, about seven years ago on this issue of, a, of the orphans and adoption, we would have never done this. This is crazy. It's stupid. It, Joey is a senior in high school right now, our youngest son, and a year from now, we would be empty nesters and free. I'm going to be 68 when Gracie graduates from high school. I told Wade and Joey, you're going to have to push me down the aisle when she gets married in my wheelchair. <laughs> but is God tugging on your hearts? Is this something that maybe you have kind of put off to the side? Is, is this something that those excuses have continued, but maybe is tonight the night that God's saying, will you respond to the cry of one child? that's crying out for a mommy and a daddy, that's crying out for a husband, and that's crying out for your love. You know, uh, there's, as I said, there's a myriad of ways that you can respond, and in your bulletins there, you were given a packet, and there's a sheet of paper in this that has three ways that you can be involved in it. And as you look at this, you can see that you can do maybe one of these three. You can adopt a, a tote, adopt a tote project for foster children. And there's a desk out there that explains what this is of, of how you can help these kids that are taken out of their homes and in distress. And are, many of these kids are taken out with literally only the food or the clothes on their back. And, and we want to help the human services folks to provide for these kids. Maybe you could donate to Lifelong, or Lifesong. What Lifesong is, it should be Lifesong for orphans. What this is, is uh, a way that we can help families that are adopting financially. That you can give tax-deductible uh, donations to Lifesong, and this goes into a fund for Canyon View, and families from Canyon View that are adopting, they apply to this, and they do a matching grant for them. And so uh, you could, do, you could uh, uh, put resources into that. And the third thing is we are going to have a uh, run, river run for the orphans. Uh, looks like the beginning of June. And you could volunteer for that. You could start training now and run in it. 
And uh, so you could be, if you have a business, you could help uh, support it and be a sponsor. So those are some of the ways that you can be involved. But what I want you to do is if you have something that God's tugging in your heart that I think I need to respond somehow, that, that I need more information, I, I want to get introduced more to what's all involved in either adoption or foster care, on your bulletins that you were given here of Woven Families, it's got a picture of James Lee on the front. It's got a slip that you can t- fill out and tear out, and the ushers will be standing at the door with uh, a bucket, and you can put these in there, and someone from the Woven Families Ministry will follow up with you. Okay? So, two years ago, we, we had this wild idea that I, I just... You know, I think it's good sometimes to pray, and it sometimes gives you these big, bodacious dreams, you know? And so I had a dream when we came here, Jane and I, and, and Jane wanted to start this adoption ministry. And, and really, all of these families that are here and involved here, uh, it's a credit to my wife, Jane, not me. So let's give Jane a hand for all of her work that she's done here. The dream that, that we had was 100 kids that would be either adopted or placed in foster homes, in loving homes in this church. And we've not at 100 yet. Did you hear me say yet? But it's amazing what God has done just in two years. And so I have a treat for you. I'm going to ask the kids to come up here And they have a special song that they want to sing to you. So, kids, why don't you come on up? What you see here is these are kids from various families that have either been adopted or in foster care, and there's also a number of their siblings, and we got a few parents holding the little ones. So here we go. Stay here, you guys. Stay here. Stay here a sec. Stay here. Okay, you guys. Wrap your minds around this. Here in Grand Junction, we have kids from South Korea. Gracie, we have kids from China. We have kids from Russia. We have kids from Africa from South America. We have kids from the United States, and we have kids from Grand Junction that now have found a home. 
that now have a mommy and a daddy, that now have hope, that they have been brought here from the four corners of the world, and they're singing about Jesus. The question that I have, is the Lord calling you to go get one more? Domestically, maybe internationally. Psalm 68, 5 says, A father to the fatherless is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. These kids were once one of those lonely kids crying out for mommy and daddy. And now they have their loving homes. So here's what we're going to do. Okay, you guys can go down now. Thank you very much. We're going to give uh, you an opportunity to respond to the Lord if God is tugging on your hearts. And if you feel like you need to do something to help an orphan or a foster kid to find a home. We want you to, let's just all stand right now. And we're going to have the ministry team and any of the woven family parents that want to pray. We're going to be up here. And as the music is playing, we're going to invite you to just come forward and get prayer. Get prayer for God to give you direction and for God to give you the resources and for God to lead you and to give you wisdom. Because this is something that we as a church, I think God is smiling on us because we're responding to the needs of kids like this. And so, Lord, right now, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would come and that you would move in the hearts of any men or women that are in this room right now where you're saying, I want you to go get one. Or I want you to be deeply involved in helping others to go get one. And so, Lord, for whoever that is, that you're breaking their hearts for what breaks yours in this particular area, Lord, I pray that you would meet them here tonight and that your kingdom would come in their hearts as it is in heaven. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you go from here. I hope this was a blessing for you guys tonight. Please check out the information booths as you go out. In there, they have cookies for you if you want. And for those of you that would like prayer, please come forward. We would love to pray with you. God bless you.